Come on in, everyone. Hey, right. looks like you got only about eight of you guys in here. That's not quite the size of the class, so we obviously need some more. Uh, I did, uh, send you your invitation, uh, quite late. So I certainly understand that some of y'all might, uh, <laughs> might not be here for that reason. I apologize. You know me, I don't like to wait till last minute to do something. So of course I'd send out the invitation at 518. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Jing. I think your name is Hellrod. Oh, yes, that's right. It is, okay. That's a cool sounding name. I like it. <laughs> Thank you. My name was an accident. <laughs> was it? Yeah, it was supposed to be hair. And, like, the birth. Uh, really? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Like someone made a mistake on your birth certificate or something when they sent it to you? <laughs> yeah, basically. That's great. Yeah. I think it's like uh, definitely unique, and I like it. It sounds like you're... Uh, I don't know. You, you've got ideas about who this person's going to be when they come in the door. Like, ah, they'll run. Now, now stuff's going to happen. <laughs> uh, hi, how's everybody doing? Anybody? Uh, I think most of you guys had me last uh, summer for Physics 1. Uh, feel free to ask me any questions you might have. It's going to be run essentially the same way as that was. Those of you who haven't had me before, uh, I'll go over a syllabus, the syllabus I didn't post yet, but I, I'll pull up an old syllabus and, and look at that. Uh, the syllabus should go up sometime tonight or tomorrow. Uh, I've sort of just like enjoyed my week off and didn't do anything I was supposed to in preparation. So I, I suck, but I, you know, I just enjoyed my daughter cause she's getting ready to go away to college and this is my last couple of weeks with her. So kind of, you know. A little depressed, a little sad, missing my my last of my daughters. So the other one left uh, two years ago. So it's you know it's just a it's a heady time for people that care about their kids. <laughs> All right, well we've got eleven. I don't want to waste too terribly much time, so I think I'm going to go ahead. Thank you uh, for the congratulations. Uh, yep, she's. She's going away to another school. She actually was lucky enough to do high school and an associate's degree at the same time because she went to the early college. So she uh, gets to leave with an associate's degree already and starts as a junior in college. So that's kind of a neat thing for her to do. And it's been tough. She had two years of college while she was a high school kid. And one of those years was during a pandemic. So we're proud of her. And uh, just like my other daughter, she's at NC State, and I'm proud of her. So, all right, well, let's let's start by uh, me opening a syllabus and run through uh, some of the important stuff, which is uh, kind of helpful, just giving you an idea how the class is going to be run. So, let me share my screen with you. Now, I'm actually doing this differently than I have in the past, specifically in the past uh, when we start 242, I normally start with chapter 20, uh, 21, which is the uh, electric field chapter. And I don't have a problem doing that. It's just uh, I always go back and cover 17, 18, 19, and 20 to some extent, but 17, 18, and 19 completely. So in doing that, uh, 
I started thinking it might be more helpful to my students because the hard stuff is really the electricity and magnetism. That's where I'm teaching all new math and stuff. And I'm thinking maybe the first day is not the, the day to, to bring out the most difficult integral you've ever seen in your life, which is what happens when you teach physics 21, uh, chapter 21 uh, in the first day of physics. So uh, I just decided to, to do it differently. So right now the homeworks in my lab and mastering uh, are out of order. There's going to say chapter 21 is due. It's not. Uh, I will have that fixed by tomorrow. And uh, the first chapter that's going to be due is chapter 17. And that's what we're working on tonight. So, uh, and we're basically going to go at a clip of one chapter per day. So uh, at that rate, uh, you know, we can keep things going. Every now and then I might uh, need to do a second day for a chapter, or I might need to do a second chapter for a day. Uh, but right now I'm leaning towards just a chapter a day. Anybody have any questions on that? All right. Well, I've got this uh, syllabus pulled up that you guys are looking at. This is a syllabus, obviously, from my internet class uh, last semester in the spring. So it's a little different. What, uh, what, well, this part's actually going to be the same right here where it says PHY242 night. That's what I want you to put in the first or the beginning part of your subject line if you ever send me an email. Okay, so first, if you send me an email, I want it, one, to come from your TCC email account. Two, I want the subject line to start with PHY242 night, and then you can put anything after it if you want. Uh, and three, I want you to have your first and last name on it. Okay, so if you have all that, it shouldn't be a problem. That being said, I still miss emails. Okay, even when everybody does everything right, I occasionally miss an email. Uh, my policy is going to be within one uh, business day. So let me show you the extreme version of that that I'll be using. So let's say you send me an email as early as 12.01 a.m. on a Friday. So that's right after midnight on a Friday, you send me an email. Uh since it's a Friday, the next business day is until Monday. That means uh, the way that I define one day means I should reply to you by 11.59 on Monday. So 11.59 p.m. on Monday, I'm supposed to uh, reply to you. If I haven't replied at that point, then you should probably, especially if it's something really urgent, you should probably go ahead and send me a text message. Okay, so... Uh, this is part that I don't necessarily want to go on the internet. Uh, so let me quickly send you guys a message. Stop sharing for a second. Okay. I'm going to type in my phone number. And I'll put it over here in the messages uh, that you all can see. And... If you have an email you sent me and I never replied, then like I said, within 24 or within one business day, as I defined a second ago, then uh, you should go ahead and text me at that phone number right there. So everybody can go ahead and record that. It's actually going to show on the syllabus. It'll be on there, but I don't want to show it on my internet page. Uh, I mean, because this, this video without editing is going straight up to my YouTube channel and there's obviously a good reason for me not to want to have my uh, personal cell phone number on the internet. Uh, I can think of a, a couple anyways. So I just wanted to do this, do it this way so you can jump to uh, or, or know the number immediately and we can go to it. So I guess I've gotten past it now in my syllabus. So now I can go back and do share screen. So everybody go ahead and make sure you record that number there. It will be on your syllabus, uh, but you can record it just in case you don't get your syllabus in time and you really want to contact me. That, that uh, phone number can also be used to text me if you have something urgent. So for instance, maybe uh, it's the day of the midterm exam or something and, and you've been, uh, say, in a small car accident or something like that. That's a time when you need something. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's a time when you need something. I did get that uh, test, by the way. That's some, If you need something really quickly, that's the way to contact me is via text. Uh, so you can say, hey, Mr. Younger, I'm going to miss your midterm because I'm stuck here. That's a good time to use that. Uh, without waiting for an email first or anything like that. Okay. Uh, 
it's not supposed to be, you know, hey, Mr. Younger, I don't understand this problem here. Uh, first, send me the email. And then if you don't get a response, then text me that. OK. Uh, and the students generally know how to behave with that. Uh, I did have one student uh, once uh, that that really didn't understand social norms or something and and they were like contacting me at two in the morning Ms. younger uh, calling me and asking me where you know where is the homework assignment at? i don't see it uh, well you open your page and it'll be right there so a little stuff like that but generally i don't have that kind of stuff happening uh you don't I, I don't mind you text me whatever time you text me that's fine uh I have a I have it on sleep mode, my phone, so I won't get it until the next day unless it's something urgent. So uh, don't worry about texting me at the wrong time. Just definitely don't call late. <laughs> All right, let me go back to sharing the screen real quick. Uh, here I am. So now we can uh, look at the syllabus. Uh, this is just the generic course course description that comes from our catalog. It tells you about. Uh, prerequisites and all that sort of thing. You should always, always, always read your syllabus. Uh, I even have a link to a video about the importance of syllabus that, that'll be in the helpful links doc, uh, module in Canvas. But yeah, it's definitely something super important. Uh, it's a really a contract between you and the instructor and it limits what I can do. Uh, and it tells you what you're expected to do. So in that sense, it's very valuable. But there's a lot of parts that aren't necessarily that valuable uh, in the sense that, for instance, down here, these are the quantitative literacy and scientific literacy are the portion of the core competencies that this course addresses. So when a student graduates, for instance, from any college or university, uh, they expect a certain number of pedagogical uh, competencies, and we've sort of listed them in uh, in our catalog as well as in the VCCS system and stuff like that. Uh, and basically, you should have some level of mastery after finishing two years at TCC. These are the two areas that you're going to improve upon at TCC as a result of this class. So in the sense of the big picture pedagogy and all that stuff, yeah, that's very important. But in terms of this course, it's not that important to you because really at the end of the day, all you care about is what chapters I'm, co I'm covering, what, what are the homeworks gonna be found, where are the tests, that sort of stuff. So I'll skip through this. This is the book that we're using. It's Physics for Scientists and Engineers with Modern Physics. It's the fifth edition of G. and Coley's book. It has to have that with modern physics part because uh, normally this calculus-based physics sequence is a three-semester sequence where you have physics one, which is classical Newtonian mechanics, uh, physics two, which is often uh, electricity and magnetism and waves maybe or something like that. Sometimes they put other stuff. And then the third semester would be all modern physics, which is uh, it would start with relativity, then it'd do quantum mechanics, nuclear physics, maybe cosmology, stuff like that. So we have found it virtually impossible to offer a three, se three semester sequence course at the community college level. So what we do instead is we bring in special relativity in physics 241 and sometimes get to elementary particles as well. And then in physics 242, we do electricity and magnetism, thermodynamics, and we get to quantum mechanics, and occasionally we might get to nuclear physics. So that's why it's got to have that. There's the ISBN number. The manual, we're not using a lab manual anymore. What we do is uh, we actually give you, uh, or at least in my lab, I give you a Word document that is the, the official lab write-up, and you actually insert text straight into that and turn that whole document in with texts and photos and pictures and calculations added and different color font and stuff like that. Uh, so in principle, you can do this whole uh, lab without using any paper. So that's sort of nice. And uh, that saves money. Uh, it keeps you from having to buy a book, all that good stuff. Now, here's what you need. Obviously, you need access to the textbook and access to the online homework system. Uh, that is sometimes called modified mastering physics. It might ca be called my lab and mastering, all sorts of stuff. But the student store sells a little card and in it will have a number that you can scratch off and then read the number and type it in. And it, it gives you quote unquote free access. 
Uh, now, y'all, many of you took this last summer. I'm not sure that's going to be valid again this summer. Uh, in fact, I know we've changed books, so it shouldn't be. Uh, we're now in the fifth edition. Yeah, in fact, since we changed books, we, it definitely cannot be. So, yeah, y'all are going to have to get another one of those. So the good news is it comes with an ebook, and you don't need, uh, you don't have to have a printed book. You don't have to have a covered book or whatever you can. If you like that, if you prefer that, uh, what I would recommend as far as the cheapest way you could do it is buy the package for modified uh, physics or for my lab and mastering, whatever it is that comes with the e-text. And I don't think they sell it anymore without the e-text, but buy that and then go get a fourth edition or even a third edition uh, to have, because if I ever assign anything out of the book, you've still got the electronic version you can use. Uh, and really the, the, a good fraction of the text hasn't changed that much. And it's a good book in the third edition. It's a good book in the fourth edition. And you can get those a lot cheaper. Okay. You can also buy this instead of if you if you didn't buy it from the uh, textbook store, uh, you can also buy it straight from the website. So when you click on my lab and mastering that you see over there in the left-hand side of Canvas, uh, when you click on that, it'll give you opportunity to buy it. It also gives you like a two-week grace period. So you can... Uh, Obviously, use that if just to make sure you're going to stick it out, which obviously this is a second semester course, so I'm sure everybody's going to stick it out. So you definitely need the textbook. You definitely need the access to my lab and mastering. Uh, but like I said, when you buy the access to my lab and mastering, at least the one that we have, it comes with the e-text. And I was told that's the only way they're going to offer it now. I don't know if they actually implemented that, but that's what the salespeople told me. You also need a ruler. Uh, a centimeter ruler, not inches, that won't do us any good. A protractor, a pen, a pencil, a eraser. I really recommend you have graph paper, but you're not required to. Okay. Uh, you definitely, definitely, definitely have to have a scientific calculator. If you happen to be majoring in, say, biology as opposed to chemistry or physics or uh, virtually any branch of engineering, there's not much need. Uh, if you're majoring in biology or one of the life sciences, there's probably not much need for you having a really decked out scientific calculator. So just find the cheapest one you can. I found them for $9.99 at Walmart and Food Line even. Uh, and if it has the button, the sign button on it, S-I-N, if it has that on it, it's, it's fancy enough. Okay. All right. So these are the learning outcomes. So these are the diff different things we're going to be able to do by the time the course is over. Again, that's not super, super necessary. Uh, that's just generically telling you what's going to, uh, what we're going to cover. What I really need you to pay attention to is stuff like this. Be very careful using books, notes, and internet for help and homework and online tests. I do occasionally, well, uh, with the online course, like y'all have, you take a bunch of online tests uh, that count way less because you're allowed to use the internet. You're allowed to do Google searches. You're allowed to use your book. You're allowed to use your notes. You're just not supposed to interact with another person in real time or get a message from another person or see something that another person wrote after taking the test. That's, that's the basic rule. Uh, but again, I have no idea who's actually taking that for you. I have no desire to check. Uh, it's really sort of on your honor. Uh, but if you get in the habit of looking at Chegg in the wrong way and various other websites in the wrong way, it will actually make it harder for you to pass. OK, so I talk a little bit about that. What I tell my students to do is uh, as you're trying to read the book and I hope you attempt to read the book, you need to take a break at each example. Make sure you make some sense of what the example is asking for. Try to think, given what you've read so far, how you would solve the problem uh, and then proceed after you've thought it out and thought about how you would solve it, then proceed to reading the actual solution and trying to make sense of it. They're going to skip steps and stuff like that. You need to make sure you can fill in the missing steps. You should know why they used one equation as opposed to another and all that sort of stuff and really you know, dive deep into it then ideally what should happen is you should be able to close your book, uh, basically restate the problem and solve it again completely on your own from front to back. 
Okay. If you can't do that, then you need to read over the example again uh, and don't go on until you figure that example out. Uh, that's the way you should do it as you're reading through. And then when you get a problems on homeworks, you've already finished the reading the chapter. You've already worked through all the examples the way I just told you. Uh, you probably will be able to have some ideas of how to start the problems. You might not in some cases, uh, but that's where Chegg comes in handy. If you don't even know how to get it started, uh, that's a good thing for you to use Chegg for or, or Khan Academy or something like that. You look at it, try to make sense of how they do it. Again, like you did with the example, try to make good sense of, of exactly what they're doing. Try to see if you can figure out why they did what they did. And then close Chegg or whatever resource you're using and try it again. Okay. If you can't make it all the way through, go back, look at the Chegg again, try to make more sense of it, close it, and then go back and try it again. That's really the way you're supposed to use a solutions manual or a Shalm's outline or a Khan Academy or a uh, Chegg or any of that kind of stuff. If you if you come become too dependent on the actual source like Chegg or whatever, uh, it will harm you because there is a creative aspect of solving physics problems that we stress. Uh, and that creative aspect comes from you figuring out how to solve problems and how to use your math to get you know different results, how to solve a system of equations, that sort of thing. OK, so watch that. Uh, watch out for that. Uh, let's see. There will be a comprehensive midterm and a comprehensive final exam. And those are the two times where I get to actually take a, you take a test that is proctored. Okay. So someone's going to be watching you. You can take it at the testing center, for instance, if you wanted to, or you can, uh, what we often do is a lockdown browser with respondents monitor, uh, so you either have to have a webcam that is working and uh, good enough that I can see your face, your eyes, all that good stuff. You're going to have to present an ID, a photo ID with your name on it. So uh, I can compare the photo ID to your face. And then you're going to take the uh, ca camera and shine all over or show all over your workspace area, every distance that you can lunge to, it's called within a lungeable distance. Uh, so I have to see like under your desk where your feet will be. I have to look at both sides of every sheet of paper you've got laying on your workspace and all that stuff. So all that's got to be done. And then you take your test. Okay. Uh, that's the midterm and that's the final and uh, because that's the only time I really know who's doing the work, they count like usually on the order of 45% of the course grade. And guess what? This is why I'm warning you about the Chegg stuff. It turns out the midterm, all the online test averages will be in the high 90s, uh, maybe occasionally a low 90 or something like that. And then they take the midterm and the class average is like 60 or 50 or something like that. Okay. Okay. So that often happens, and you still have a couple of students that don't get a 98 or something like that on the midterm, but it, it's, a, it's a stark difference, and part of that's because you lean too much on uh, the systems that you had available, the books and notes and that sort of stuff, and, uh, you know, part of it might be a little test anxiety, but the majority of it's just you haven't learned the material, and it, it's really hard to know whether you're learning or not, <laughs> okay, so uh, if you're looking up stuff too much, if you can't ever work a problem or can't ever start a problem without first looking at it on Chegg or something, uh, then you're probably not learning it. OK, so keep that in mind uh, and keep it in mind that your midterm and final are going to count a lot and they're going to be proctored. OK, so you have to have access to respond this lockdown. You have to have a computer that can run respond this lockdown monitor our lockdown uh, browser as well as one that can use respond this monitor which obviously has to have a webcam uh if you don't have that you can get one or we can set up your tests at the testing center or you can come in and take it you know with my face-to-face -face class or something like that that's all well and good as well uh, i'm also not averse to uh spreading that 45% over more tests. 
So uh, basically 45% of your course grade has to come from uh, grades where you're being proctored. So if you were willing to do less online tests and more, you know, proctored tests, I could maybe uh, boost up that uh, percentage for the online tests, but that would be on a case-by-case -case basis if you're interested, okay? All right, so the schedule obviously is going to be different because this is the last semester, but it, it shows you, as I told you earlier, we started with Chapter 21, and then later on, we do 17, 18, 19. And in fact, I even left 18 off of there. Uh, but anyways, we will instead start off with 17. And that's what we're going to work on tonight. Uh, I'm reminding you about how to email me. Let's see what else here. So this is the other part that's super important from your syllabus. Uh, you can see one, I'm on a 10 point scale, sort of. Notice that I actually give you an 11 point uh, range to actually get a C. So you can go as low as a 68.5 and still get a C. And again, I give you another 10 points, but one point lower to get a D. Uh, you can make as low as 58.5. Now, uh, for instance, a 58.49 is not a 58.5, okay? So it actually has to be 58.5, not just rounded to 0.5, okay? Uh, you can see the online test. Uh, the lowest will be dropped. It's only worth 10% of the course grade. The homework, which is a little harder to get people to do for you uh, so uh, because of so many of them, that's worth 20% of the course grade. And then there's conceptual home, homework that's worth 5% of the course grade. Okay. I drop the lowest two grades on your homework and I make up various uh, extra credit assignments throughout the semester. Like I, something will just come to me and I'll make one up. Whenever those happen, what ha uh, whenever I give you one of those, what happens with that is you do it and I will basically grade it. And if it looks like you essentially got it right, I'm going to give you 100. If it looks like you missed a whole lot, I'll, I'll give you some advice on what to do. You can resubmit it again to get that 100 or I'll just leave it off. OK. Uh, but what happens to that grade now is now the number of drop grades goes from two to three, and everybody that doesn't do it gets a zero in that one. Everybody that does do it gets a hundred uh, or nothing. Okay. So all the extra credit done that way just goes to helping your homework grade because a lot of times students just have a hard time getting good grades on their homework. Uh, and again, that's the homework here, not the conceptual homework. The comprehensive midterms worth 20. The comprehensive final exams worth 25%. Uh, lab grade is worth 20%. There's not a separate grade for lab and lecture. Uh, they both get the same grade. Uh, you're going to have Miss uh, Raskovic, and I'm probably mispronounced her name. I might not even, uh, might have left out a syllable. Uh, I know her. I just uh, forgot to look at her the spelling of her name. Uh, but anyways, you will have her and uh, she might do things a little differently, but she will at the end of the semester be sending me your grade. Okay. Uh, that, that lab grade depends on however she chooses to do it. Normally the way I do it is about 50% of your grade is attendance. 50% of your grade is lab grades. In other words, how, how good are your lab reports? But if I find students are not all participating, if it looks like I've got consistently one or two people that just never contribute to the lab, then the whole course will, will be required to take a comprehensive lab final. Okay. Professor? Yes. Oh, sorry. I don't mean to interrupt, but no, um, I think all of us have Mitchell as our lab professor. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Class. Yeah. Thank you, Nora. I, yeah, you also I, pronounced it correct. I actually had her as a high school uh, teacher for physics. Okay. Cool. Physics, yeah. Yeah, but, she's, yeah. She's nice. She's, uh, she's, a, she's a good lady. But yeah, I'm glad you corrected me or told me I was correct on that. I thought I was, but I was afraid of being that wrong and, and you know, offending her. But yeah, well, you're right. Y'all do have Mr. Mitchell. Us. I forgot. Yeah. Or the Chesapeake campus. Completely forgot it. <laughs> yeah. And he's fun. Uh, so y'all, yeah, y'all will love him. Uh, he's also a, a skilled magician and just a all around fun guy. All right. Uh, practice tests. 
So here's your big chance to get a lot of extra credit. This is a huge amount of extra credit. So every test, I give you a practice test beforehand and just rule of thumb in any college or university course, if anybody ever gives you a practice test, you should do that immediately uh, and you should do it often and you should ask questions immediately and you really take advantage of it. Instructors in college are usually kind of busy. We don't have a lot of extra time. If we took the time to make a practice test, it's really a smack in our face to not take it. I don't hold such things against people, but I'm, I wouldn't be surprised to find, you know, one or two teachers out there in the world that get really upset that you don't take a practice test. So your rule of thumb, definitely take a practice test if someone gives you a chance to have a practice test in a college or university because that is not the norm, okay? Now, sadly, that still happens. I still get a lot of students that just don't take my practice test, which is insane because I literally make it out of the same bank of questions that I use for the test. And I guarantee that at least 80% of the points on the actual test will come from questions that you had access to through that practice test. Still, as I said, I get students that don't take it. So to entice them further, basically what I do is at the end of the semester, I take the highest grade you got on each of those practice tests. That no matter how many times you take it, I'm just going to take the highest one. And I take the average of all those highest grades. I divide that by 20. And that many points is added to your final course grade. So it's literally up to five points added to your final course grade. So definitely, definitely take me up on that. Uh, that also means, of course, if you don't take one of them, that's going to be averaged in as a zero. So you want to make sure you take all of them. Uh, but anyways, that's what that is. Uh, and that's the major way to get, get extra credit here. The other extra credit, like I said, just helps you on your homework grade. I don't really enforce any major attendance policies, but if you if you're missing, you know, about a week and I haven't heard from you, I'm supposed to drop you and I will. So make sure if you have to miss or something, make sure you get me in the loop early and let me know and contact me frequently and I'll do my best to keep you in the class. Uh, mo other than that, it's mostly just attendance for the lab and stuff like that. That's really important. Uh, I don't really have issues with behavior. I've never had anybody be loud or obscene or something like that. It could happen, but I have rules about it just in case. Uh, electronic devices, okay, if you get, get caught uh, doing something suspicious, okay, uh, and suspicious as deemed by me, then uh, you will get a zero for that as a minimum for that particular score, for that particular test. Uh, so, in other words, you're not supposed to have anything capable of accessing the internet or anything capable of holding pictures or notes or anything like that uh, out during a test. So if you have a nice calculator, but it's on an iPad, you're not going to be able to use it. If you have a nice calculator, but it's on your iPhone, you're not going to be able to use it. So for your midterm and your final, that means don't have that stuff out if for some reason we discover it's out, there's going to be uh, consequences uh, and they could include, you know, disciplinary action, that sort of thing. Uh, usually not a big deal. It's, you know, we have a respondents lockdown browser. Uh, there's a process you go through in doing that to, that helps me feel confident that you're not uh, doing other things, but it's not foolproof. But the fact that the class average goes down a lot tells me that probably people aren't getting away with a lot of cheating. So that's what this electronic devices policy is about. Let's see what else. Uh, so down here, I'll have the, the the due dates, drop dates, and all that good stuff. So they'll be in there. But that's the main part of the syllabus that I wanted to cover. Uh, it'll have a calendar like the one that I showed you, only it'll be you know correct for this week. But like I said, we should be covering essentially chapter 17 tonight and chapter 18 on Wednesday night. So hopefully that helps. Anybody have any questions? Okay. I have questions, um, but yeah. I think somebody somebody commented a question about if we 
will get formulas on the exams or are we expected to remember them? Gotcha. Yes, I allow, especially in the summers, I allow you to have an equation sheet. I'm in the process of trying to make up an equation sheet so everybody uses the same equation sheet. But until that's done, that means you're going to have to make them up yourself. By hand. Okay. My, my rule, by the way, on the equation sheets is uh, – I don't mind if you write a single word. So for instance, uh, uh, you might say X equals displacement. Okay. That would be acceptable. I, I don't allow you to write the actual names of laws or sentences down on the, the thing. So if there's a few sparse words, like just pointing to what this variable is, that's acceptable. But if I see stuff like sentences or strings of equations that aren't numbered, uh, that's the other thing. You're only allowed to have the equations that are numbered in the book. So if you look at uh, some equations, they won't have anything over in the marginalia about it, but other equations will have like 17.8, and that means equation 8 from chapter 17. Uh, when it has a number like that, 17.8, then that's an equation you're allowed to have on your equation sheet. If it doesn't have that, uh, you're not allowed to have it unless I explicitly told you otherwise. For instance, I'm going to make up an equation when we get to chapter 21. Uh, I'll make up an equation that you can use, and you won't find that in your book at all. OK, so just keep that in mind. That's what the equation sheet's about. I don't have a limit on the number of pages front and back or any of that kind of stuff. You just you're limited by what ones you can put there. And the main reason why I don't allow sentences is because a lot of times students occasionally see that occasionally our test questions are actual examples from the book. So they'll, you know, write sentences explaining how to do certain examples that they didn't understand. Or occasionally we try to give free easy questions like state Newton's second law of motion. Uh, if you have them labeled, that sort of defeats the purpose. But you can be assured if there's a, a chapter called Newton's laws uh, or a chapter called Newton's second law or something like that, then it's probably a good idea to know exactly what that is. OK, and that's that's generally the case. Any, any kind of equation that has a name, uh, you should almost certainly need to know that name. OK, don't write it on your equation sheet, though. All right. Now. See, um, Ms. Brad, I got that. Okay. Yes. I had the other question, which is about the Canvas page. Mm -hmm. So far, all we can see on Canvas, like for the modules, is week zero and then week one, which is the, the January week. And right. then stuff like that. Is that from like your past class or is it, will that be updated? Yeah. So the, I threw, well, week zero is correct. That, that stuff okay. that really should be right. Uh, but that's just sort of, Hey, this is what I expect of you having completed 241. Uh, and it has stuff like coordinate systems and junk like that, but it all was going on the assumption that we were starting with chapter 21, which is why week one has chapter 21 stuff in it. I will fix that immediately after class tonight. Oh, okay. So the dates will be fixed and stuff like that. Um, yes. and then, I don't think we have any files yet on Canvas. So like the the syllabus hasn't really been loaded. Like if you click on syllabus on my end, it's like weird. Yeah. There's, no, there's no actual syllabus link. Yeah, that. Um, uh, in fact, I don't use that syllabus link. I've been, I've tried to okay. figure out how to use it where it's nice like other instructors, but it's never mm -hmm. worked out for me. So what I do is in the area, like I just showed you on that other course, in mm -hmm. the area where it says useful documents, that's where my syllabus will be. Useful documents. Is that in the modules or? Uh, actually, it's okay. Here it is. I'm looking at it now. It's helpful documents and links. Hmm. Oh, modules, bottom of the page. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And everything's sort of run by the modules. So I know students go into different parts of their Canvas page when they get here. Uh, my go-to page is the modules page, and that's sort of what I expect everybody to go to first to see, you know, what chapters we're doing, where's the homework, that sort of stuff. Gotcha. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Okay. All right. Well, we got up to 13 people in here now. Uh, yeah, let's say, well, there, okay. I was just reading over the comments to make sure the chat, just to make sure I hadn't missed anything. There was something someone had wrote about 
looks like it's recording. Oh, gotcha. Yes. Yeah, I am recording the lecture and I do every time. Uh, the sad part is it takes a lot of time. So when it's done, Zoom's got to convert it. That takes a, a while. And then I've got to upload it to YouTube. That takes a while. Uh, so it, it, it's often not available to you until the next morning. So just keep that in mind. But yeah, I always put them there. And you'll notice when you see my uh, when you see my good notes, you'll see that I named them in a very specific way. Like today's will be called PHY242 N01C underscore 05222023. Now that's the name of the file where my notes will be. And when you look in my Google Docs, you will find the notes there and they will have a name like that. Well, if you look in the actual video description, you'll see that same uh, list of characters so that you can tell when you look at any any of the videos on my YouTube channel, you'll be able to find uh, the YouTube or excuse me, the notes from my Google Docs. OK, so I just wanted to let everybody know that. Uh, I guess I got everybody in a good place now. So uh, let's go ahead and get started on some of the course material. Specifically, let's start talking about uh, Chapter 17 and that sort of stuff. So let me see if I can share my screen now. Hopefully everything's working. I had to buy a new computer all of a sudden uh, last semester, just at the last second. So uh, it's always exciting to see whether or not something's going to work. So I'm going to do share screen. Yeah, cable, no airplay. I guess that's, I think that's it. And about once a week, it asked me to download a plugin first, even though I would download it every time. It still asked me to do it every time. So yay for that. All right, let's see if I can get this. Okay, are y'all seeing that uh, graph paper looking page right now? Uh, no, it's just still looking for me. Nothing okay. yet. That's not good. Let's try this one. Oh, oh sorry. In the meantime, um, uh, if you don't mind me asking, do we have the access code yet for mastering physics or anything? No. And in fact, the way I do it, you don't need one. Ah, oh, there, it finally worked. Okay. Uh, the way I do it, you don't need one. It All your homeworks will be right here in this Canvas page. And if you don't want to go to a particular homework, you just want to go to something in My Lab and Mastering, you can click that link on the left-hand side that says My Lab and Mastering. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you. No problem. All right, so I now have this document uh, opened. You can see, by the way, there's my YouTube channel uh, URL. So uh, that's where you have access to it. I would recommend subscribing. You're, you know, obviously you can unsubscribe when you get out of the class or whatever, but it's good to have because every time I post something, it'll update you and let you know, oh, you know, Mr. Younger posted this and it usually like sends you the title too. So you can usually tell if it's helpful. So for that reason alone, I would recommend you uh, basically subscribing to my YouTube channel, even though you're probably not all that interested in <laughs> that kind of YouTube content. But anyways, so uh, you can see now, uh, basically, we're going to go into chapter 17. And chapter 17 is called Temperature, Thermal Expansion, and the Ideal Gas Law. Uh, if you recently had chemistry, you've probably had plenty of experience with the Ideal Gas Law. Or if you had uh, chemistry even in high school, you probably had uh, experience with the ideal gas law. So I don't do a whole lot of examples with that, but I do some. Uh, but what we do cover is temperature and thermal expansion and that sort of stuff. So uh, I'd like to go ahead and start covering that material. Uh, first thing I want to let you know is uh, there's this quote 
that I think it was Richard Feynman said. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Richard Feynman. Basically, someone asked him, hey, you know, it's it's the end of the of the world. Everybody's getting ready to die. Uh, there's a new species on the planet or something, uh, or hopefully there'll be some other people coming later on the planet, and you can leave a sentence to them, and that's all you can leave. What would you leave? Uh, and he basically said that... Uh, Matter is made entirely of little things that jiggle uh, that we called atoms. And he explained a little bit more with it, but uh, he said that's the most important thing. And that could get, uh, you know, a new culture, a new uh, civilization started uh, with by saving a lot of time. OK, so that tells you in some sense that the atomic theory of matter must be fairly important. And what the atomic theory of matter is, is basically that, yes, the matter that we know of, so this excludes some of the stuff you might have heard about recently from astrophysics, dark matter and dark energy. Uh, we don't exactly know what that stuff is yet, so we have to exclude that. But what we do know is that matter is made up of atoms. Uh, the smallest stable matter is really the proton uh, and then maybe the neutron, the electron, stuff like that. But once those come together, they can make atoms and then that's super, super stable. Uh, not unlike the proton, it's super, super stable. But we have certain numbers of protons and the number of protons dictates exactly how it behaves chemically. So, uh, and we've since learned that quantum mechanics tells us, you know, if you have this many atoms, or excuse me, this many electrons, then only two will fir uh, fit in the first level, and then uh, six will fit in another level, and so on and so forth. That ends up giving you basically just the number of atoms uh, in each of the levels. And it turns out that the outermost level is really the most important. And anything that has that same outermost configuration acts like anything else that has that same outermost configuration. So, for instance, if you've got just a single loose electron, I say it's loose, it's still attached to the atom uh, in the outer shell then every element that has that acts just like hydrogen because hydrogen has one electron, okay? So if the outermost shell is holding exactly one electron, uh, then that atom, whatever, however many protons it has, is still going to behave somewhat like hydrogen. And in fact, uh, instead of H2O, you could have whatever element that is with a two by it and then an O. So if it was nitrogen, for instance, it'd be N2O, but it's not nitrogen because that's not in, uh, that doesn't have the right configuration of its outermost electron shell. In fact, that turns out to be why the periodic table is ordered the way it is. Basically, you go, uh, the number of protons is from left to right. So the first element has one proton, that is hydrogen. Now that hydrogen can be just one proton with one electron and that's hydrogen, but it can also be one proton and one neutron with one electron and that's still hydrogen. We call it deuterium, but it's still hydrogen and you can still make water with it. And it could be uh, one proton and two neutrons. And again, one electron, that's still hydrogen, but we call it tritium and it still can make water. Uh, and in fact, we call both of those heavy water and they're, they're used in nuclear reactions uh, to actually specifically to cool down nuclear reactions. Uh, next, you go up one on the number of protons and then you get helium. Helium has two protons. Well, at that lowermost orbital, that orbital can only hold two. So that's a full outer shell. So you might think, well, it has two electrons, so it should be in the second column of the periodic table, which it sometimes you'll see it there, but it also has a closed outer shell, a completely full outer shell, so it acts like a noble gas, 
uh, it, which means it should be in the last column. So that's why you often see helium listed twice on a periodic table at once in column two, but also in column, I think it's eight or whatever it is. Uh, but the main reason is because it acts like everything else with a closed outer shell. Uh, then you go to three, which is lithium, and then four, which is beryllium, and then five, which is boron, and six, which is carbon, and so on and so forth. But every time you go up by one, you change the element to a new element. So really, the number of protons is all that matters in deciding the electron configuration. And then, like I said, since the outer shell is so important, that's why we have this column. And we've had, for instance, learned over time the impact of that. One case being that if you look at a periodic table, uh, you will see that uh, basically your bones and your body uses calcium right? So anything that gets in your body that happens to be in the periodic table below calcium, your brain might, or your brain and your body might mistake for calcium. Does anybody know any stories related to that? Somebody, okay. So there's a, a, a tragedy that happened when we first discovered radium, uh, Madam, uh, uh, what's her name? the Nobel laureate chemist and physicist, maybe the only female one you know of, uh, Curie, Madame Curie. So when Madame Curie discovered radium, we didn't necessarily know that that radioactivity was dangerous. And in fact, we later did experiments and figured out it was very, very dangerous. But the neat thing was that uh, we could actually take that radium and paint it on to say the the face of a watch and then it would go in the dark so you could actually read the watch well this is world war one era basically uh and of course all the men are away uh all the women are actually you know trying to make ends meet and get money coming in and stuff like that so they hired a bunch of young women to come in and, and paint the watch faces with radium uh, well, what do you do when a brush gets a little ratty at the end instead of a nice point? You dip it on your tongue uh, to make it pointed again. Well, that's what they were doing. Little did they know radium was actually dangerous. But in fact, what they were doing was ingesting radium. And the body was treating it like it's uh, calcium because it's on the periodic table in the same column as calcium. And what they had was, you know, women that were maybe 23, 24 years of age, having broken hips and broken bones uh, like a 90 year old would. And in fact, in many cases, they literally glowed in the dark. So that's a, a real life ramification of the periodic table and the way it behaves. And you just got to remember, hey, it's going to do the same thing. So, for instance, if you find an element directly above lead, then uh, that's probably one of the elements that uh, your body's going to treat lead like. Uh, that's how we know some of the stuff we know about uh, lead receptors in the brain and, and how lead poisoning uh, damaged so many kids. So that's just something to keep in mind. And with the atomic theory, that's part of it is making up different elements as a result of individual numbers of protons. But it's also something a little bigger than that. So what we've discovered eventually was that there is something that gives us a measure of the temperature of a body. And it turns out to be the average random kinetic energy of the atoms or molecules in a thing is essentially proportional to the temperature. So in other words, if, if you could stop time, and then go through the human body and interview every atom and molecule and say, okay, your atom number 872,452,000, blah, blah, right? What's your mass and what's your average kinetic energy or what's your average speed, okay? And then you write those down and then you calculate something called kinetic energy. We'll learn later, or we've already learned one half mv squared. You, you write that down for that particular atom, and then you go to the next atom or molecule and do it again, and do it again, and do it again. When you're all finished, you then compute the average 
random kinetic energy of all those atoms and molecules. There's a very specific way to do it, but the main thing is you're going to calculate an average. And what will happen is you take that average and basically multiply it by a number and boom, you get the temperature in Kelvin. Okay, so that's a big deal. That tells us, yeah, the atoms are really, really important. Uh, not only that, it turns out that we can uh, make sense of atoms, of how big they are, how much they weigh. Uh, when I say big, like what their radius is, all sorts of stuff like that. And we know that they jiggle. And we know that they jiggle forward, backwards. That's one dimension. Left, right, that's another dimension. Up, down, that's a third dimension. But if they're actually molecules, then the individual molecule, which might be made of two atoms, acts like a dumbbell, so it'll spin around an axis, it'll spin around another axis, and so on and so forth. It turns out those kinetic energies are totally unrelated to temperature. So when you get more complex molecules, there's a lot of different ways the atoms can move that doesn't go into increasing the temperature of them. So now we've learned yet another thing just because knowing atoms exist. So uh, how do we go with that? Well, now that I've given you that, I can also tell you, for instance, that a liquid in a liquid state, the atoms or molecules are farther apart than they are in the solid state when they're locked in a sort of lattice, which you can imagine like a jungle, jungle gym or something like that with the atoms at the corners where rods are meeting. Uh, if you keep raising the temperature, they're going to vibrate ever more violently as the temperature goes up and up and up, eventually what will happen is uh, the vibration will get so big that it breaks the bond between adjacent atoms or molecules. And when that happens, now the molecules are just free to sort of roll over each other and around each other, but they're not going to get stuck in that, in that lattice anymore. And that's a liquid state. If you heat it up even more, that that energy becomes so erratic that they don't stick so close to each other anymore and they break loose. And when they break loose, they become what's called a gas. OK, so now we have uh, an understanding of what happens by the change of temperature, uh, how things change state and stuff like that. Now. In order for us to proceed, we need to know some stuff. And one of the things we want to know is, well, how are the mass of an at of atoms, how are those masses related to the you know, number of protons and stuff like that? Well, for starters, it helps to have a, a, a useful measure of mass. So it turns out there's one that we created. It's called the Unita Unified Atomic Mass Unit, U. And one U is equal to 1.6605 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Okay, that turns out to be a useful scale of mass for atoms, okay? It turns out, in fact, that that is defined such that such that carbon-12, which we write this way, Carbon-12 has a mass of exactly 12.0000. You can put a bar over it if you want, U. Okay? So carbon-12 is the one that has six protons, six neutrons. Uh, that's where the 12 comes from. And, of course, uh, six electrons, because the electron number in a, a neutral atom has to match the proton number. So it has six, six, and six as the number of particles. I think from that you can sort of reason out that... Uh, there's another relationship for this 
for this you that might be popping out at you. Uh, if you remember in the periodic table, it, there will be masses, for instance, I think like, for instance, hydrogen, the mass of hydrogen, the molecular mass of hydrogen is 1.002 something, right? The way we learn that in chemistry anyways, is that this is grams per mole. And that's actually correct, by the way. That's that's what it is. But what they have there is they have a weighted average where they took the preponderance or the probability that you grab a, a, ra a atom at random uh, in our atmosphere and you grab it at random. What's the probability that it's going to be uh, hydrogen? What's the probability that it's going to be the deuterium form of hydrogen? And what's the probability that it's going to be the tritium form of hydrogen? So if you multiply that percent times the weight that corresponds to that particular type of hydrogen, and then do that with the next one, and then do that with the next one for all those different isotopes, it, that average is what you actually report on the periodic table. So when they say the mass of hydrogen is 1.002, what they're meaning is that's the average mass based on the isotopes that we know of and the percentages that they come in. So when you look at carbon, for instance, it's not going to be 12. Uh, carbon's going to have a mass of 12 point something because they're not doing carbon 12. They're doing uh, the average of carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14, so on and so forth. Uh, let me pull up a periodic table real quick. I'm just Googling it. So periodic table, I want one with some numbers on it. And of course I chose one without any numbers because that's so helpful to me. Okay, so like I'm looking right now at carbon. Carbon is 12.011. By the way, hydrogen is 1.008. So let me fix that. So there's hydrogen. The mass of carbon is in fact equal to 12.011 grams per mole but here's the other part that i'm trying to to teach you with this is this new uh unit we have for mass this uh, uh, unified atomic mass unit the u that i showed you that actually has uh that is actually the same mass as what these masses are. So for instance, writing 1.008 grams per mole is correct, but you can also say that the hydrogen atom is equal to 1.008 U. And the mass of a carbon atom is most likely going to be 12.011 U. Does anybody remember what a mole is? Or does anyone at least know what a mole is? <laughs> is it the Avogadro's number? Yeah, Avogadro's number of atoms. So uh, it's nice to know uh, an actual count of the number of atoms that are there, even if you don't know it precisely to the nearest whole number, knowing in some sense how many atoms there are, that's, that's kind of helpful. You'll see that that comes up in calculations later. So uh, it turns out that uh, the fact that hydrogen has a mass of 1.008 grams per mole and that the hydrogen atom has a mass of 1.008 U might let you realize that in, in some sense, one U is equal to one over Avogadro's number. So you might think, oh, crap, here's another constant I got to learn, when in actuality, you don't. Uh, I will put a little squiggly over it because it's actually, you got to do a little bit of work. 
So to actually show this, what you do is do one divided by, and Avogadro's number is 6.022, and that's four sig figs. Uh, So we should be able to get this right to four sig figs, which would be 1.661, roughly. But this is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And that is items per mole. Okay. But here's the weird thing. You actually need this to be related to kilograms. So you're actually going to have to then divide it by a thousand. So you're going to say times one over one zero 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 to convert it from grams to kilograms. Okay. So if I do that, if I do one divided by 6.022 E to the 23rd, I get 1.6605 times 10 to the negative 24th. Now I'm going to divide that by a thousand. So all of these digits are ones I'm not entitled to get. But, so I underline them. Uh, times 10 to the negative 24 times 1 over 1,000 should come out to be kilograms. That gives me 1.661 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms okay so yes it is actually the same thing as one over avogadro's number so that's why it happens to have this neat uh relationship that 1.008 grams per mole can also be called 1.008 atomic mass units per atom or per molecule or whatever okay any questions on that All right. Well, this knowing this immediately allows us to do things like, hey, uh, what is the distance between atoms in, say, uh, steel? So how far apart are atoms of iron at 20.0 degrees Celsius. And the only reason why I'm putting 20.0 degrees Celsius is because density and and materials in general always expand when you have an increase in temperature. So that's one thing. But in in this case, we're going to make use of the density. And the density, of course, is measured for a given temperature, too. So I'm going to rapidly Google uh, density of iron seven point eight seven four seven point eight seven four grams per cubic meter since uh, its atomic mass is, now I'm going to look at my periodic table, and for iron, we see 55.84. So how far apart are the atoms? So this is what we're going to do. We're going to make use of the information that I've given you to try to figure out uh, exactly how far apart they are. So what I can do is I can imagine 
atoms in a lattice, like you see here, and then atoms in a lattice this way as well, and then atoms in a lattice this way as well. Johnny? So basically what we're going to do is I'm going to say there's N, I'm going to say there's N atoms this way. In other words, there's N rows, there's N columns, and then there's N layers. Okay. And what I'm going to do is assume that maybe just, just for argument's sake, this is one way of doing it. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Let's assume, in fact, this is, uh, that this is, in fact, one mole of atoms. Okay. So uh, we'll say N times N times N. That's the total number of atoms. That's going to be equal to Avogadro's number which means that the mass would actually equal 55.84 grams. Okay. So if I can actually figure out what N is, then I would have uh, the ability to say, okay, well, uh, this particular uh, block has a certain density, obviously. And with that, if I find out the number of atoms on a string, I can divide. Uh, well, actually, I could I could say. Yeah, I don't think I want to assume it's a mole. Let's not do that. Let's do. I'm going to put a red line through that. We might still come back and visit that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, again, it's N times N times N atoms, okay? And with this one, I'm going to say, uh, let's say that's a cubic meter. That's a better way of doing it. I think I could have gotten it that way, but that wasn't the normal way, and I just thought about it on a whim, and I, I just didn't want to make a mistake <laughs> on the first day. So let, let's do this. Let's go ahead and assume that the mass of this is, so this will be our solution. The mass of this is 7.874 grams. And that's the, supposed to be grams per cubic centimeter. Stupid head. Somebody might want to check that, by the way. Uh, make sure you all correct it. That's grams per cubic centimeter, obviously. And that would be pretty light stuff if it's only seven grams per cubic meter. So what this means is one side of this could be one centimeter. And then one side of this could be one centimeter. And then one centimeter again. Okay, so that's what we're picturing by calling this 7.874 grams. We're saying that that's a cubic centimeter of iron. So when I do that, I know that, in fact, the number of atoms is 7.874 grams divided by the number of grams per atom. Well, I don't know why I wrote an M there. Number of grams per atom. I can go ahead and call this 0 0.007874 kilograms. And then down here, what I know is this is 0 0.055 
kilograms, uh, excuse me, U per atom. Okay, but that doesn't give me just the number of atoms. That gives me the number of kilograms per U times the number of atoms. So I need to convert that uh, U to kilograms. So what I'm going to do is now I'm going to take and multiply that bottom by Avogadro's number. So 0 0.007874 kilograms divided by 0 0.05584 times uh, 6 point, or actually I want to divide it by Avogadro's number. So I'll just write Avogadro's number up top since I'm dividing it by that. That'd be 6.022 times 10 to the uh, negative 27 kilograms per U. So that automatically cancels out the U and leaves kilograms. And this is still U per atom. So by doing that, I've now gotten the number of atoms. Point so point zero zero seven eight oops. Point zero zero seven eight seven four times six point oh two two. Ooh. That'd be plus 27 here, by the way. Sorry about that, because it's, uh, remember, I had to change Avogadro's number from 23 to uh, 27 by dividing by 1,000. So basically what I'm doing is taking that, multiplying it by 6.022 times 10 to the 27th. That converts the U's to kilograms. And then the kilograms cancel out with the kilograms. Oh, great. That didn't work at all. Point zero seven. Hey, Professor. Yes, ma'am. Why are we dividing by 1.661 since 1u equals 1.661 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms? <laughs> you, you're thinking uh, the, the same <laughs> line of reasoning that I was just running across. I'm trying to remember if I flipped it over twice by accident and and that that's mm. probably what you're looking at so yeah uh let me do it this way let's uh i'm gonna take this <laughs> and pull it over to the next page i'm trying to fit myself in a spot so that's not doing very good uh i'm trying to fit all this work in one little spot so now let me see if i can paste here there you go. Ah, darn it. I put it up there and then it disappeared. Paste. Okay. That's good. Okay, so yeah, what, what she said is I, I probably made a mistake. Let's kill that. Let's go back from the line we were in. So I'll start this by killing this right here. But that is still you per atom. Dang it. I hate it when it happens. So now I can do this. Okay. And I should get rid of that too. There you go. So I, I now have what's ostensibly correct. So what I'm going to do is I'll say the number of atoms. Is equal to. 0 0.007874 kilograms. And now I'm going to say 0 0.05584 U 
And then I am going to say that one U, and this is one U per atom, by the way. So I'm going to say one U is 1.6605 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, which is the conversion factor that I gave you earlier, which is the same thing, like I said, as one over Avogadro's number with that special caveat. Okay. So now I can see what math I have to do. And this is just going to give the number of atoms. Okay. Does everybody understand why it gives us the number of atoms? Anybody not ignore understand the that? Uh, centimeters cubed when you look at the density? Exactly. Uh, yeah, the centimeters cubed, because I chose the using the density as a model, I chose a one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter cube. So what that is, is a cube whose length is one centimeter, but ostensibly will have N times N times N atoms in it. So all I have to do is once I have the number of atoms, uh, I can just take one centimeter and divide it by that number, and that'll be the centimeters between atoms. Does that make sense? Uh, a little more, yeah. Thank you. Are we supposed to multiply by 1.6605 over 1u because we're trying to get rid of u? So that would cancel the u out and then cancel kilograms out, which gives us atoms. Dang it. Or one over atom. Yeah, I said I didn't want to make a mistake. Uh, see, I clearly did. Yes, you're exactly right. I put it upside down. Crackhead. Nah, I'm talking about myself, not you. <laughs> 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 well, I might call you that later when I get offline. I'm like, ah, oh, that'll turn there. <laughs> 1.6605 times 10 to the negative 27. Nice catch. Thank you. That that I was just getting ready to type that in. So that would have uh that actually would have been a, a, a nasty mess that I'd try to figure out, and that would not be fun. So yes, I am now multiplying by 1.6605 times 10 to the negative 27 in the bottom, of course. And you can see now that the kilograms is canceling out with that kilograms, just like the U canceled out with that U. And all I'm left with is 8.492. Whoa. 8.492. That's four sig figs. I'm going to add one more. Zero times 10 to the 25th atoms. OK, so that's actually the number of atoms. Now, that number also equals. By our conjecture. I should underline that zero because that's an extra sig fig times 10 to the 25th atoms. Is equal to N times N times N, which is N cubed. So that tells me N is going to be the cube root of all that. So I now raise this number to the point three 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 power. And when I do that, I get 4.395. That's four sig figs. And then one extra would be five again with an underline. Times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. To the 8 uh, atoms. Okay. So that's the number uh, of atoms that'll be along one edge, basically. Any of the edges, for that matter. So if I want the distance between them, notice if, for instance... If N was four, then this one centimeter from here to here, anyways, whoa, that was a big no-no. This one centimeter from here to, dang it, I hate it when it keeps changing that to a eraser. This one centimeter is sliced up into four parts. 
one, two, actually into three parts. So if I want to know the distance between them, then I need to basically divide this distance by three, which is n minus one. Obviously, n minus one doesn't matter that much compared to n when n is this large. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say these little distances right here is the separation distance, which I'll just call s. And I'll say s equals separation. And that never feels right when I write separation. It always feels like I should write an E there. So I may be spelling it. I don't care too much. But anyways, I'll just give you the caveat that I, I know better than to think I know what I'm doing when I spell that. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say one centimeter divided by 4.3955 times 10 to the eighth atoms would give me the separation per atom. So I'm going to say one divided by that answer. And that gives me 2.2751 times 10 to the negative nine centimeters is the separation between them, okay? If I wanted that in meters, then I could take and say 100 centimeters and I put that on the bottom because I listened to Nora uh, and then put one meter on top and you see that this is S is equal to 2.2751 times 10 to the negative 11 meters so that's the separation distance and and for all intents and purposes that's often what's used as the actual diameter of an atom notice it's comparable to the bore radius if you've had chemistry or physics before you know that's uh 5.0 5.092 or something times 10 to the negative 11 so it's on the same order of magnitude there Actually, it's 0.529. That's what it is. 0.529 times 10 to the negative 11. Any questions on that? Okay, so that's one of the things you could actually do just by knowing, uh, well, in this case, we actually had to look up the density of, of iron, but just by knowing uh, how a atomic mass unit is related to a kilogram, uh, and how all that relates to the actual atomic mass, we were able to figure out how big atoms are. Okay, so that's, again, something really helpful. So now what we want to go to is, uh, now that we've covered that part, we'd like to go a little further in thinking about uh, the thermal aspects of this. We're going to tell you about temperature and, th and thermometers. Yes, Tanner? Uh, I just wanted to ask, why can we assume that it would just be centimeters and not centimeters per atoms or per atom? Okay. Uh, why can we assume it's not just centimeters instead of, it, it, it is just centimeters, but if you use words like atoms in your units, sometimes that can help you keep from making a careless mistake. Uh, so, for instance, I knew I had to flip that over because I needed the distance per atom. And I had distance. So that's why I used atoms from the very beginning so that I could use that as a gauge and make an argument for flipping the result over at the end. Does that make sense? Uh, I think so. You, you do that a, a lot of times. Uh when you, you take something like the, the mass from the periodic table, you can think of that as grams per mole, or you can also think of it as uh, atomic mass units per atom. It is sort of always done with the grams per mole, and it's almost never done with the use per atom, but it's more or less the same thing. You're just saying, hey, I want to remind myself that this quantity measures 
A. And in the first case, it was a mole. In the second case, it happens to be an atom. So you can, you know, if you had the mass of an electron, you can call that a certain number of kilograms per electron. If you had the charge of an electron, you can call that a certain number of coulombs per electron. So you can always add per whatever it is to units, and that can help you figure out mathematically what operations you got to do to get the, the value that you want. Does that make sense? Or maybe a little bit better? I think so. Okay. Uh, and also read the way the book did. I did it slightly different from the book. Actually, I ended up doing it much more similarly to the book than I had planned, but that was because I uh, freaked out and thought I was going to actually possibly make a mistake by doing it, uh, doing something careless. So I ended up switching back to doing more or less like the book does it. Uh, your book does it for copper, though, as opposed to iron. Uh, 17.2 uh, is about temperature and thermometers. So uh, given that we know that the atoms and molecules are in motion and that the actual temperature is a measure of the average linear kinetic energy of those atoms and molecules, uh, we can then devise things to actually determine temperature. So you could take anything, uh, for instance, any amount of matter and put it in contact with the thing you want to know the temperature of. And what's going to happen is the extra kinetic energy, if assuming the thing that you want to know the temperature of is hotter, the extra kinetic energy that the individual atoms and molecules of that thing has, uh, once they start contacting with the other thing you put it in contact with, then the average kinetic energy of that new thing atoms and molecules, that's going to increase. So by putting it in contact with another, you're already interacting with the actual particles moving. And if there was some relationship between, say, the size and the temperature of an object, then you could use that object as a thermoscope. And when I say thermoscope, I just mean a thing for measuring temperature, but that hasn't been calibrated to a particular scale. So anything who has a variable value that changes with temperature can be used to make a thermoscope. For instance, you can run current through a wire. If the wire is a certain temperature, it's going to have a certain resistance. If it's a higher temperature, it's going to have a higher resistance. If you can measure the resistance of it, you know, at 20 degrees Celsius and then measure it after it's been in contact with something for four hours straight, then you can be pretty sure that the resistance associated with that thing when it's in contact with it is the resistance at the temperature of the object whose temperature you wanted to know. And then you just use your formula to figure out what that temperature is based on that resistance. So that's that's the way a uh, uh, electric type of thermometer can work, is just literally measuring the temperature. Another thing is that... Uh, like I said, essentially everything expands when it heats up. I say essentially everything. Water actually does the opposite. It turns out uh, the max density of water occurs at uh, four degrees Celsius. And if you get colder than four degrees Celsius, it actually gets less dense. So it actually expands when you get colder in that case. Uh, so that's kind of weird. But anyways, other than that, just about everything expands. So if you have something that measures the length of something, you could use that as a thermoscope. What what we normally do, and these are the thermometers that you're probably used to uh, for checking your temperature, at least when you were a kid, uh, was a, fill, uh, a glass tube that's filled with a liquid of some sort. It used to be mercury. Mercury is a good one because mercury has such a high density. It changes very little uh, uh, by a very small amount, but a, a readable amount. But mercury is also kind of toxic, not that good for you. Uh, they also have alcohol thermometers and toluene th thermometers. But the main thing with that is they've stretched out this little cylinder so thin that really you're just treating a one-dimensional object and the volume is actually increasing, but because it's one dimensional, it's only doing it by one of the dimensions is expanding. So what's happened is this column of mercury or column of alcohol that was this tall 
when you put it in contact with the thing you're measuring, it reached equilibrium temperature with the thing you're melt, uh, you're measuring. And in doing so, the column raised. And the amount it raised is directly proportional to the change in temperature. So all you have to do is you take this glass tube, you fill it up with uh, the alcohol or the mercury or whatever, and then you put it in a bath of ice water at zero degrees Celsius and wait for it to stop moving. Once the alcohol stops moving, you make a little etch or a scratch on the glass where the top of the alcohol is and you're going to call that zero degrees then you take the same thermometer and stick it in a pot of boiling water leave it there till it stops moving when it stops moving you're going to make a little scratch mark on the glass again and that one's going to be called 100 and again we're using celsius obviously and then all you have to do is take that whole measurement from zero to 100 and divide that by 100 and uh, use that distance between each of the lines, and you will now have a, a graduated thermoscope, which is, in fact, a calibrated thermoscope, and it's a thermometer now, okay? So that's how you can make a thermometer, and it's all based on the idea that uh, substances expand and contract. Uh, Another thing you can do, this is kind of neat, and you probably, depending on how fancy and new your thermostat is in your house or your apartment or whatever, uh, you will probably have a thermostat, and the old thermostats were really cool. I, I wish I was in my, uh, I wish I would have brought one home, uh, but basically, if you open up a thermostat and you look inside uh, the, the non-electronic type, what you'll see is a pin in the middle, like this. And then you'll see a piece of metal that comes out and goes in a spiral around and around and around and around and around like this. Bunch of, bunch of spirals. And then ultimately it'll come to an end like that. Okay. And it'll have a little bar on it that might be, say, the pointer. Okay. And the neat thing is they'll often have uh, like a looks almost like a Tylenol capsule, it, but it's made out of glass and in it is mercury. And at this side, you got a wire that comes into it and another wire that comes into it. And then on this side, you got a wire that comes out of it and another wire that comes out of it like that. So what this is, is called a bimetallic strip. So a bimetallic strip is basically you take a piece of metal like so, maybe it's made of iron, and then you bond it, weld it, glue it, whatever you want to do with another piece of metal, let's say aluminum, and the fact that they're different metals means that they're going to have different coefficients of expansion. In other words, temperature coefficients of expansion. So for instance, one metal will expand a lot for uh, you know a little bit of temperature change, whereas the other one will only expand a little bit. So what happens is as the temperature changes, the amount of tightness of the spoil of the spool uh, changes. And what's going on is the bimetallic strip is bending. So what happened is the stuff on the left, the iron, evidently expanded more than the other metal. And I'm not choosing to say a metal now, even though I said one a second ago, because I don't know off the top of my head which one uh, has a higher temperature coefficient of expansion. But whatever happened, the iron expanded more. And that caused it to curve. Okay. Because of that, that made this thing spiral more around in, inside of that thermostat. And it forced that little capsule to, to pull over to the side so that now mercury is connecting those two wires. So, for instance, that could be the wire 
that whenever a current goes through it, it tells your AC unit to turn on, right? And then on the other side, uh, those could be two wires that tell your heat to turn on. So when the temperature gets really, really cold, then maybe it'll be like this. And now the mercury is connecting the circuit for these two and the heat comes on. So it's really, you know, pretty ingenious, some of the stuff that engineers and scientists have come up with. Uh, and this is one of the cases. So AC comes on. So that's something you can do using the properties of materials, uh, specifically the fact that atoms move more erratically at higher temperatures. You can also do like a, a typical thermometer, which is a bulb that acts as a reservoir of, of a liquid. And then uh, that liquid is going to expand. In fact, liquids expand quite a bit more compared to solids. So you can get more bang for your buck and you can make a thermometer that way. Uh, in your actual textbook, they actually have a photograph of a bimetallic strip being used as a temperature gauge, uh, you'll sometimes see that like on the lid of a grill or something. And that's what this one looks like. It looks like a, a temperature gauge from the lid of a grill. So in order to, to make sense of this, we need to understand our temperature systems. So first off, you, hopefully you all know this, but you know that water boils at a very specific temperature. Does anybody know what that is in Fahrenheit? 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Excellent. 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And it also boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Right? Now, water also freezes at 0, 0 0.0 degrees Celsius. What about... What does it freeze at in Fahrenheit? Was it uh, 32 or 36? Yeah, 32. 32 degrees Fahrenheit is where it uh, freezes. So this is sort of two marks. And in fact, you know there's a relationship between Fahrenheit and Celsius, but we don't want you memorizing that formula, the good pedagogy uh what we've discovered about good education is that we've discovered that students can better understand it and stuff of this sort and better understand the two systems by doing it a different way. And that's what I'm going to explain to you now. You should be able to convert between Celsius and Fahrenheit. And here's how you do it. What you see right here is a difference of 100 Celsius degrees. Notice how I'll put the degree after the Celsius. That's what you do when you when you subtract two temperatures. You put the degree afterwards. Similarly, right here, I have a difference of 180 Fahrenheit degrees. Okay. So that gives you a relative measure of the two systems. What we can say is 180 Fahrenheit degrees is the same thing as 100 Celsius degrees. And of course, that reduces to 18 over 10. And that reduces to 9 over 5. That also could reduce to 1.8 over one, a bunch of different ways you can express that. But the main thing is you need to know that it's Fahrenheit degrees to Celsius degrees. You could also write it the other way around, which is 100 Celsius degrees over 180 Fahrenheit degrees, which is 10 over 18, uh, 5 over 9, uh, 1 over 1.8. Uh, again, in this case, it's Celsius per Fahrenheit, okay? So what we do if we want to convert temperatures, let's say 
what I use for my students is I tell them this little mnemonic. 30 is hot. Well, I, I actually write it better than that usually. <laughs> 30 is hot. 20 is nice. Ten is cold. Zero is ice. Okay, so that's a nice little mnemonic to help you remember what the temperatures are. Uh, I was training some Blackwater people uh, back in, well, a decade or more ago. Uh, so they could make the the Grizzly vehicle, their, the thing that was supposed to replace the up-armored uh the up armored Humvee, uh, they were making this Grizzly, but everything had to be made in the metric system. So I had to teach them the metric system and I've discovered that when I was teaching them the metric system. So it's a, it's a nice, neat little thing. But let's look, for instance, at 20 degrees Celsius. What is uh, 20, let, let's do 30 degrees actually. So what is 30 degrees Celsius Whoa. Whoa, that really went bad. When I want to erase it, the thing won't give me an eraser for nothing. Okay. What is 30 degrees Celsius in Fahrenheit? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, how far is it from freezing? You could also do how far is it from boiling? That works as well. So solution. One, how far from freezing? And I mean freezing of water, of course. So 30 degrees Celsius is 30 degrees Celsius minus zero degrees Celsius equals 30 Celsius degrees. Okay. So two... How far is that in Fahrenheit degrees? Notice I'm putting the degree after the Fahrenheit again. Well, 30 Celsius degrees, I need the Celsius on the bottom. So because uh, Nora taught us that. Uh, so I need the Celsius on the bottom. So, for instance, I know that the 9 corresponded to uh, the Fahrenheit and the 5 corresponded to the Celsius. So, I'll say 5 Celsius degrees and 9 Fahrenheit degrees. And then I'll check back here to make sure I said that right. And lo and behold, 9 over 5 is Fahrenheit over Celsius. So, that works great. So, uh, when I do this math, I say 30 divided by 5 is 6 and then 6 times 9 is 54 so i get 54 fahrenheit degrees okay now i know that 54 fahrenheit degrees is how far this temperature is from freezing so now i gotta find out in part three what is this temperature given that freezing occurs at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So now all I do is I say 54 Fahrenheit degrees plus 32 Fahrenheit degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's my answer. So, yeah, I'd say 86. I mean, I'm a fat dude, and 86 is pretty freaking awful to me. I hate it. it makes me want to punch a baby, right? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that, that's a hot temperature to me. So, 30 degrees is good. 
let's try another one. Uh, this, that's how you do it from Celsius to Fahrenheit. Now I'm going to do, uh, let's say, let's say 80, no, let's say 92 degrees Fahrenheit. So what is 92, whoa. 92 degrees Fahrenheit in Celsius. So here's my solution again. Now, I am always free to use any temperature point that we know. So I could use the boiling point of water as well. I'm going to use the, the freezing point of water, though. OK, but if it's a high number, you'd be probably a little smarter to use the Fahrenheit. I mean, the uh, freezing, the boiling instead of the freezing. So first off, one. How? Whoa. Far from water freezing. Well, that's 92 degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 degrees Fahrenheit. That gives me 60 Fahrenheit degrees. Two, how far is that? In Celsius degrees. Okay, so I'm going to take 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I'm going to say uh, nine down here for Fahrenheit degrees and five up here for Celsius degrees. Uh, 60 doesn't go in, uh, nine doesn't go into 60 very easily, uh, but it does go into 54, uh, which is nine times six. So uh, it would be nine times, or excuse me, six times, and then I have four left over. No, I have six left over, which is six ninths, which would also be three and three. That'd be two thirds. So I'm going to say this is, in fact, equal to 6.66 Six degrees or Fahrenheit degrees, excuse me. Times five. Oh, the Fahrenheit degrees already canceled out, so I can actually didn't have to do that. Turn, whoa, Nelly. Times five Celsius degrees. So, uh, yeah, that gives me that. So five times six would be 30. Uh, that'd be 33.3333 Celsius degrees. So now I move on to part three, which says, uh, what is that temperature? given zero degrees Celsius is, whoa, freezing. So before we had to add 32 to it, but here uh, I just add zero. So I'm going to say 33.33 3 Celsius degrees plus zero degrees Celsius gives me 33.33 degrees Celsius. And that's my answer. Assuming I did that arithmetic right, which I'm going to check now. Let's do 60 times five and then divided by nine. Yep, 33.33. So any questions on that? Can you clarify what the difference is between um, like degrees Celsius and Celsius degrees? 
Yeah, so I'm I'm using that to help me remember what the number I'm using is. But when whenever you take a difference in temperatures, like you go, you know, 25 degrees Celsius minus 12 degrees Celsius, then that turns that into Celsius degrees. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, you'll see that when we in in the next equation we use. Uh, as a typical example. So now we have that. Now it turns out there's also some other coordinate, some other uh, systems of temperature. And again, I'll say water freezing and water, or excuse me, water boiling. Let's make that a B. Yeah. And water freezing. Uh, that would be 100 for degrees Celsius. And that would be zero. And then for degrees Fahrenheit, that would be 212, and this would be 32. Now, it turns out there's a Kelvin system, which doesn't have, notice it doesn't have a degree symbol. Degree symbols are things that we normally use on scales that are arbitrary. So, for instance, have you ever thought about why do we use degrees uh, for an angular measure, but also for temperature and other things? Well, those were made up based on an arbitrary system. For instance, the ancients who were using a base 60 number system uh, found that the number 360 was particularly nice because a lot of things go into it. Uh, two goes into 360, three goes into 360, four goes into 360, five goes into 360, six goes into 360, so on and so forth. So that's a really convenient number, but it's completely arbitrary. Uh, however, if you make a plot of, let's say, uh, pressure versus temperature, in degrees Celsius, and maybe this is in Pascal, say, of every element and every compound you can think of, then what you'll consistently get is lines of varying slopes, but all of them having one point in common. And every element, every compound we've ever known of does that. Now, uh, obviously, the data is sort of made up when you get close to 273, but they all converge back at negative 273. And because of that, if we ever met an alien species from an entirely different uh, galaxy even, there's a high likelihood if they were advanced enough to be traveling here that they will have a, a temperature system at which zero is the same zero that we use. It might not be called Kelvin. It might not have the right symbols, all sorts of stuff, but they're still going to have a, a system very much like that. So with this case, this became 273. It's actually 0.15. And this one became 373.15. And there's an equivalent system for the for the Fahrenheit, and that's called the Rankin. I'm never going to do anything with the Rankin system, and I, I, I might occasionally give you a Fahrenheit temperature uh, that you obviously need to convert, uh, but that's about all you're going to do with Fahrenheit. But if I remember correctly, it's like 543. Let's see. Uh, 458.67. So this is uh, 458.67. Actually, hold on a second. Let's say the Rankin scale is... I, wanted to, I, I was looking for a picture and instead it gave me there it is, 491.6. 32 Fahrenheit is supposed to be 491.67. And then 
Is 671.67. Okay. So there is another system, and that's called the Rankin system, R A N K I N E. Uh, but I'm just teaching you that for completeness and, you know, in case you ever appear on Jeopardy. <laughs> Any questions on that? All right. So we've done a little bit of stuff in this chapter so far. Uh, what we need to understand is really your book mentions the zeroth law of equilibrium or excuse me, the zeroth law of thermodynamics, and it's about thermal equilibrium. So if I take a thermometer and when I first make the thermometer, I put it in a bath of ice water and then I scratch on that where the alcohol comes up to, then I've marked the zero degree Celsius mark. And then I do it with boiling water and I mark the, you know, the 100 degree Celsius mark. So, and then I calibrate all that good stuff. Now I take that thermometer and I stick it in uh, some substance and it reads the temperature. You can't just jump to the assumption that if it now reads zero degrees Celsius, it's automatically exactly the same temperature as the original water sample that I used to uh, calibrate it. But that's exactly what it is. And we just hadn't put a, enough thought into it at the time. So after the fact, we made up the zeroth law of thermodynamics, which was made up after the first, second, and there's even a, a, a hint at a third law of thermodynamics. All of those came out. And then we went back and said, OK, well, we should probably do this one. If two systems are in thermal equilibrium with a third system, then they're in thermal equilibrium with each other. OK. So what we're saying is if two systems are in thermal equilibrium with a third one, so that means the water that originally you tested the thermometer with is in equilibrium with the thermometer, and then the water that you're testing now is in thermal equilibrium with the thermometer, those two objects are in thermal equilibrium with the third object. The zeroth law of thermodynamics says, yeah, in fact, the original vat of water is in thermal equilibrium with the new vat of water. Okay, so that's what the thir third law or zeroth law of thermodynamics is. Uh, again, it's sort of a oops. We, we probably should have weighed that out a little bit beforehand. Uh, as far as thermal expansion goes, the formulas are really simple. I don't feel too compelled to even uh, give you really much in terms of examples for thermal expansion but what i will tell you is that it should make sense to you that the change in length and remember we always use the delta as a change in and that means like final minus initial the change in length is directly proportional to the change in temperature okay but as you might imagine, the change in length of a one foot long piece of iron is going to be significantly different from the change in length of a one mile long piece of iron, right? So that would compel you to say it's also proportional to the original length. And then you, uh, if you remember from Algebra 1 and Algebra 2, to make a proportionality into an equality, you have to put a, a constant in front of it, a, a coefficient, if you will. Uh, in this case, we basically decided to make the constant the one that depends on the uh, actual material you're using. So ultimately, what we get is the change in length is equal to alpha L0 times the change in temperature, okay? Now, that might not look like the way you do it, but uh, that is a way to do it. But if you break it apart, you'll see that that is L minus L0 is equal to alpha times L. I don't know why I put that, degree, <laughs> that mark up top, but clearly I did. Hold on a second. Let me get rid of that. 
Well, let me get rid of that now. Okay. That's equal to this times T minus T zero. Okay. If you do that, then you can get this neat new expression. We can just say the new length is equal to L zero plus alpha L zero T minus T zero. We see that there's a common uh, factor of L zero in there. So now we can say L is equal to L zero times one plus alpha delta T. And that's another version that we can use. That is the linear expansion. And this constant right here is called the temperature coefficient of linear expansion. Sometimes they leave the word temperature out. Okay. So uh, those problems are very straightforward. Uh, let me know if you have any problems with them. I've got examples that I'll be posting on your module. Uh, at, that's from my YouTube channel. So there's there's examples on there. Here's the, uh, the actual coefficients that you'll need for the problems are given on, I believe, the page number. Uh, it's, it's table 17.1. And I don't know what the page number is, but that's a table of alphas and betas because it turns out there's also a volume uh, coefficient of expansion in which it turns out it's really close to like three times alpha. But basically what we find is there's another formula, delta V meaning the change in volume is equal to beta times the initial volume times delta T. And that's another expression we can use. It's a very straightforward equation, though. Uh, you, you know, a typical problem is uh, calculate how much the volume of a gas tank changes when the temperature goes from 20 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius. And then do the same thing for the volume of gasoline, for instance. So that's a that's another thing that can uh, be done with this type of uh, equation. Pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, that's the rest of the stuff. Really, is about the ideal gas law. So I will remind you that the ideal gas law has a couple different forms. PV equals NRT is the way I normally learned it, uh, or the way I learned it. And N is the number of moles. So you will need to recall how to do that. Remember, basically, uh, that the atomic uh, mass that you, you get from the periodic table, that mass that's listed on there, is not only in use, atomic mass units, unified atomic mass units, it's also in grams per mole. So for instance, H2O, has a molecular weight of two times 1.008, because there's two hydrogens in there, plus one, because there's one oxygen. And of course, the molecular weight of oxygen is 15.999. So, So the molecular weight is, in fact, essentially 18.0 grams per mole. Okay. So if they, if they gave you 36 grams of water and they ask you how many moles is that, you're going to divide the 36 by 18. Okay. So that's something you need to be able to do. There's another version, of course, of the ideal gas law. And uh, 
actually. That one is PV equals N times K times T. Okay, where uh, R here is the ideal gas constant. And this is called the Boltzmann constant. And this is the number of atoms slash molecules. So your book goes over Boyle's law and all those different things, the, all the different uh, ideal gas uh, laws. But the main thing is uh, you should know those names just uh, from, you know, everyday life or whatever. But, you know, Bo Boyle's law and uh, Gay-Lussac's law and Charles's law and all that stuff. I'm not going to quiz you on that. Okay. You, you should know it, or you should at least be familiar with it, but I'm not going to ask you which one's Bull's law, which one's Gay Lussac's law, which one's Charles's law. Uh, but the main thing is that's where you get the ideal gas law because it turns out that pressure and volume are inversely related. It also turns out that volume and temperature are directly related, and it turns out that pressure and temperature are directly related. So what that means is you can multiply P times V, and uh, that should be, because the V would be on the bottom, that should be proportional to T. And that ultimately, we know pressure is also proportional to N, the number of molecule or number of moles, or N, big N, the number of atoms. So uh, we can have an NT, or we can have pressure times volume is proportional to big N times T. And then the constant is just a matter of which one you're using. So in this case, it's PV equals NRT. And in this case, it's PV equals big N k t and what we find out is k is actually equal to r over avogadro's number so we didn't actually learn a new constant you should be able to use this again uh, i'll be doing some uh, work with the ideal gas law in the next chapter uh but the main thing is you should know how to use it uh, the key to using it is, one, the temperature has to be in Kelvin. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. The other thing is uh, you've got to use the right value of R. And in chemistry, you used an entirely different value of R more than likely than the one we use. Or you might have at least seen the one that we use a couple of times. Uh, what I will tell you is that R is equal to 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. That's the value we normally use in physics. But you can also use this, which you'll often find in chemistry, 0 0.0821. And that's liters, atmospheres per Kelvin. Uh, excuse me, per mole Kelvin. And there's also a 1.99. And in this case, it's calories per mole Kelvin. Okay. So if you're using pressure for Pascal, uh, Pascal's for pressure, then you need to use that R equals 8.314. If you're using uh, atmospheres for pressure, then you need to use the 0 0.0821.
And if you're using uh, calories, uh, that one, I th think you might use Tor, but I'd have to think about it a little bit. But yeah, the 1.99 is another one you can use. So that's that's the key point to it. It's not that big a deal. I will remind you that uh, there is something called vapor pressure. So if you ever have a ideal gas that's over top of water, you have to take into account the pressure that comes from that. So I'd remind you to go look at your chemistry book for that. If you haven't covered, has anybody never covered the ideal gas law? You can send it to me in a chat or raise your hand or something if you want. Uh, I'm just curious. I, th I think everybody, normally the case is everybody's covered the ideal gas law some. If you haven't at all, don't feel bad. It's it's okay. Uh, I just might need to spend some separate time with you specifically to, to get you up to speed. But I think the book's examples are plenty. So you, you can probably see pretty well how to do it. Most of them are just plug and chug, literally just put in the P and the V and solve for T or put in the V and T and solve for P or put in, you know, you have to know stuff. Uh, the other aspect of this, since we only got a couple minutes left, is if you have a fixed volume container where literally like no gas can actually escape it, then uh, fixed container, That means N is going to be a constant. Okay. So guess what? You can say uh, P V equals N R T gives me N times R is equal to P V over T. Well, that whole thing is a constant. So you get P1 V1 over T1 is equal to P2 V2 over T2. And that saves you a lot of trouble. Like you don't have to actually take the time to calculate the number of moles or do you even need the mass or the number of moles? If you're using, the, if you can use this type of equation, the same thing happens, of course, if you're using capital N and KT as well. Uh, if you have something where the volume's not changing, then it could be P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over, over T2. Or if you have something where the temperature's not changing, it could be P1 V1 is equal to P2 V2. So those are various different ways you can use the ideal gas law. Uh, the other thing about the pressure is it cannot B gauge pressure. It has to be total pressure. So what does that mean? Like when you use your pressure gauge on your tire, on your car, you have a little valve stem like this. And then you have basically this round thing that goes over top of it and air comes out and goes this way and it pushes this prism object that's got temperature, uh, that's got pressure markings on it. And that thing actually comes out. Well, what you can see is this is actually pushing against the pressure of the atmosphere. So when I get 32 PSI on this, this means that the pressure in the tire is equal to 32 PSI plus P atmosphere. Because it actually had to defeat the atmospheric pressure to push that thing out. And then what it had left was what it read. And since that read 32, say, uh, then we called it 32, but that's gauge pressure. So if you actually needed to use the ideal gas law on a tire, the air in a tire, you'd have to add an atmosphere of pressure 
and PE atmosphere, it varies from day to day, but it's approximately 1.01 times 10 to the fifth pascals, which is the same thing as a Newton per square meter. It's also about 14.7 PSI. And really the best unit is, is exactly one ATM. <laughs> okay. All right. So believe it or not, because chapter 17 is a rehash of stuff that almost everyone's already taken. We didn't do much in it. Many examples on it. Uh, you, I will post the appropriate videos for chapter 17 from my YouTube channel on uh, week one module. Uh, but definitely let me know if you're having problems with it. Uh, you can ask next time. The way our homeworks are going to be due is every Monday, uh, like whatever chapter we cover on Monday, that's going to be due Sunday. And whatever chapter we cover on Wednesday, I'm going to make that due uh, Tuesday night at 11.59. So that's the way the chapters are going to run. Uh, it basically gives you a week after covering all the material, but we're literally going on the assumption that we're going to do two chapters a week. I've done chapter 17 now, uh, not, not as exclusively in, in detail as I'd like to, but that's because I had to spend time doing the syllabus first. So we'll have more time next time. Uh, stick around if anybody has any questions. If you don't, you're free to go. Thanks everybody for coming. I just have a quick question about the homework. You said we don't need the access code for the MyLab Pearson. You, yeah, just... because you'll go through my course. Well, you'll need the access code, but you don't need the course code. It's just in Canvas? Yes. Or okay. it be. It's, it's not there yet, but it will be. So the first like assignment we have will be due this coming Sunday then? Yes. And okay. it'll come up. It'll be visible tonight. It might even be visible already. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Have a good night. No problem. You too. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Thanks for coming, everybody. How's it going, Bohan? <laughs> I just saw your name. Hey, uh, Professor, I had a quick question for you. Yes. So um, I, I don't go to TCC full time. Uh, I go to VCU. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. a biomedical engineering major. I'm just taking this class over the summer to fulfill some credits. Um, I ran into an issue. I do um, work with Periton um, and Homeland Security. I do um, IT. Mm -hmm. But uh, long story short is I have, um, I, I mean, I work Monday through Friday every day. Um, and so that's how I'm kind of able to come to the night class. But right. the lab portion is right in the middle of the day. Is there any like work around that we can do with that? If I had another lab section uh, going this summer, you could attend it, but I, I, I don't, all of them we have are first thing in the morning or midday. So all right. Pretty much nothing we can do on this one. I'm sorry. If I So they're actually having the lab for this. It's actually during the day, not after. Yeah, so I, I went there this morning and I talked to uh, a Mitchell, or I, th oh. I think it's his name, um, and uh, and he said like if, if there's any sort of a uh, like leeway or or um, possibilities, like probably be through the press or, or the or the dean. Yeah, the, it's just the only thing we could possibly do would be stuff that we didn't like doing during the pandemic, which was you know allowing the lab to happen. Uh, you know, online, uh, which was a lot of simulation and not very good lab stuff. So we don't yeah. want to go back there. There's really nothing I can do uh, this time. But, you know, you'll be back in at VCU in the fall, though, right? Yeah, correct. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's I, I don't think there's any way I can help you on that. I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I try to help every student that I can. And, you know, obviously I'd want to help you, but I don't think, uh, yeah, you're going to have to miss two days a week at least. Yeah, that, that's all right. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, if, if it would help at all, like I could get like kind of like a written statement saying like I do work for them if, if that's any sort of question. Yeah, it's not so much that. I mean, I, I don't, 
I don't have a problem with whether you're telling the truth or anything like that. I wouldn't think that for, for anything, but uh, <laughs> the, the real problem is just the lab is a crucial part of, of this course. Yeah. Uh, it, it takes very specialized equipment. There's a few labs you could miss uh, that wouldn't kill you, but I wouldn't want you missing more than two or three labs total. Okay. Yeah. I, I understand fully on that. Sorry okay. about that. I wish I could help you. No. Better for you. Of, of course. You, you sounded very genuine. I, I really appreciate that. <laughs> no problem. And I know Kevin yep. would feel the same way. He'd want to do as much as he could. All right. Well, thank you, Professor. Have a good evening. You too. Have a good one. Thank you. What's going on, Bohan? You there? Your speaker's muted if you're there and talking. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, he is there. Gotcha. He typed in the chat. Gotcha. So is your uh, audio not working? Is that why you're having to type in chat? Gotcha. So what can I help you with? Oh, okay. Yeah, the chapter 17 homework. Uh, that's what I was just telling them. Uh, mastering is might not be up yet. It might actually be up now. Uh, but the way the course is done this semester, we're doing 17 first instead of 21 first. So chapter 17 is probably not even showing up yet because that we used to do that late in the semester. I'll probably fix it in the next 10 or 20 minutes. So if you can see any of the homeworks, uh, chapter 17 will be visible probably in the next 20 minutes. Have a good one, bud. Glad to see you. Come back this semester. Good luck. Bye-bye.